My name is Jennifer, and uh, thank you for coming to the IBLA here at the Sligo Museum of Art. Um, the name of this session is I Talk, Happy Talk, um, which will feature the talk by Deborah Pratt Curtis, who is over here in the corner. Um, so we're thrilled to have you here in this session and at the conference. But before turning over to Deborah, um, I do have to do a few housekeeping items, and you'll hear this repeated throughout the day. Um, in this location, the nearest restroom is going to be out the door to your right, and then you'll take a left at the Matisse, and you'll see it on your left for ladies and on the right for gentlemen. Um, we do have coffee and water in each um, room, and so it's located back there and on your table. Um, and I would remind all of you to please silence your cell phones at this time. Um, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask me or our room monitor. I just asked. Nancy. Nancy, thank you, Nancy. I'm sorry. Um, over there. And um, like I said, it's all our housekeeping items. So, again, thank you for your participation and welcome to the Curtis. Thank you very much, Jennifer. <laughs> I also have a little bit of an introduction before I get into this, and that is that I've been involved with IBLA since 1987. And it happened because I had just published a book with a visual deal with called Introduction to Visual Literacy, not knowing about the work of Bates. So my first presentation was to come to the conference in 87 and present that and where I was coming from. And I was embraced with such wonderful open arms. It was, it was truly great and it has been ever since. As far as this conference is concerned, I had already registered to come when this summer I wrote this I don't know what to call it. I talk happy talk and had not met the April 1st deadline for proposals. And I thought, you know, I really have to see if I can force my way in. So I got in touch with Scott and Smith Master and Patricia Search and Jenna Hethorn and Cindy Cullen, Adam Levine, and it was Liz Spencer who put me on the docket. And so I'm very grateful to be here and I'm very grateful for you coming as well. I thought I was going to introduce myself by giving my, my uh, six minute video from my own website, but I figured no, you can all go home and do that anyway. It traces my life as a painter from birth until two years ago, in less than six minutes. So I, I uh, invite you all to do that at simplydeborahcurtis.com. And since this is a narrative, I will be reading it. The inspiration for this essay, I Talk, Happy Talk, was from a prompt provided by one of my writing colleagues. After a long night out, you return home to find that every picture and painting in your house can speak to you. What do the characters say? As soon as I open the door, a deafening cacophony rains upon me, for my home and studio are awash with paintings, every one of them vying for my attention. I plug my ears in self-defense. Evidently, they take the hint, for through the diminishing din comes a lilting soprano and a warm baritone cheerfully singing, We are, we are happy. We are, we are happy. As I turn to their voices, the other paintings, no doubt chagrined, shut up altogether. As I gaze upon this painting somewhat in awe, my mind flew to how the painting began. It was anything but happy. At that time, 1985, the soprano hollered, Hey, Dad, here we are standing, doing nothing. The gap between us, just space, no push, no pull, spaces. I agree with Sarah, said Lance. I feel lost and bored. Let me tell you, it doesn't have to be after a long night out, implying that I'm exhausted, drunk, or high. My paintings and I dialogue on a regular basis. They speak to me, tell me what needs strengthening, what to soften, to brighten, to articulate more clearly. But the figures themselves speaking, that, I, that was something new. When they complained, I felt like I'd been clobbered. My mind scattered, went a little haywire as it shuffled through a stack of possible responses and remedies. Meditation to the fore. 
This is from Thomas Traherne, a 17th century mystic, mis English mystic. Infinity of space is like a painter's table prepared for the ground and fields of those colors that are to be laid thereon. Before I brought them together in the same painting, titled Hesh is a combo word of he and she, they posed separately. I drew Lance, a long distance intermittent lover since 1973, as he stood among the ruins in the Negev desert in 1981. No doubt inspired by the Roman sculptures we'd seen in our travels, he'd assumed a classic contraposto stance, his weight on his left leg. Sarah had modeled in my classes at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and also privately in my studio. She posed with her right foot forward, her weight evenly placed. The two drawings seemed so complementary that I transferred them to a 66 by 56 inch canvas, on which I stained an open, suggestive, rather than specific space, inspired by the Negev, fuzzy areas of colors. In the painting, their torsos turn toward the center, but their faces shrouded in darkness gaze away from one another. Light from the right casts their shadows along the presumed ground to the left, back diagonal. The gap between them harbors a troubling silence. No wonder they protested. The painting exudes a dull sadness and alienation. I wonder why I brought these two individuals together first in a painting and then later in real life. When taking advantage of a visit from Lance, I asked Sarah to pose, pose with him. They look at one another, look each other over, strangers until walking into my studio to pose nude together, <coughs> and then look to me for direction. With no pre preconceived ideas, I suggest, get closer, get it on or something. <laughs> <laughs> what a thing to suggest to a lover. Am I in my right mind? <laughs> I turn on the classical music radio station, which plunges us into Satie's Gymnopédie, followed by his Gothic dances. Move, dance, touch one another, climb around, I urge. Dancers both, their bodies soften into slow-mo improv, and as they snake tentatively about the limited space. When the music becomes playful, they cavort hesitantly touch, then dart apart as if toxic to each other. In a single sudden move, Lance heaves himself up on my large table, a ne'er-do-well old-timey science lab bench. Sarah deftly clambers up to join him and snuggles in suggestively. Is that a rousal by a spy? Oh, I know him so well. What do you expect? I imagine him retorting with a grin. After clambering around, shifting their weight and limbs in search of poses that are both comfortable and might interest me, they arrive in positions in which she sits, he crouches slightly behind her, his left arm raised on his head. Hold it, I order. With drawing materials in hand, I enter an altered state of being. What I see are neither Sarah nor Lance, nor their new bodies. In a perceptual shift, one that I call transformative vision, Everything in my visual field becomes abstract, forms in space. I sketch the basic shapes, the angles of their heads in relation to one another, the tilts of their shoulders, the location of their hands and knees, all of zeroing, zeroing in on the relationships among key facets and to the whole of the page on which I draw. When the basic composition is mapped, I begin to explore details. With a similar concentration on forms and shapes relating to one another. I know some artists chat with their models, but I never speak. I seem to lose my ability for speech when I draw or paint. As Sarah and Lance pose, I'm vaguely aware of them whispering to one another when my eyes are focused on my drawing rather than on them. They need a break. I grab a piece of chalk and trace on the tabletop the position of their butts and legs. Leaping down, they don enough cover to feel comfortable as I go to the kitchen and make tea. Alone in the kitchen, I acknowledge my vulnerability when I draw and yearn for solace in Lance's arms. But I don't feel free to seek his embrace with Sarah present. When I went to be with him in Israel, he and his wife had separated, and I hoped we might have a future together. 
But he returned to his marriage, and I to Philadelphia, and to art, my one true love I could trust. After three sittings, each 15 or 20 minutes, which is particularly difficult for Lance in such a crouch, I reach a point where I know I can complete the drawing on my own. I pay Sarah. Lance returns to his home in Montreal. I never do finish their faces. I speak, you speak, we all speak with a little cheek. Alone in my studio, I crop the drawing to show only their torsos and limbs, and later render it on a 20 by 24 by 40 inch canvas that I had previously stained with jewel-like soft colors. As I step back to contemplate it, you skin flint, Sarah and Lance holler in unison. How dare you cut our heads off? Crowd us into this chintzy little space. I don't know about you, Lance, but I want out of here, said, Lance, said Sarah. Well, I kind of like our coziness. I might be satisfied with a larger context. How about it, Deborah? While I resent their intrusive banner, banter, I must admit they're right. I look over to the large Hesh painting and imagine the smaller painting in front of it or in it. I lay both paintings face up on the floor, the smaller on top of the larger, and climb up to my loft to look down to see how they might be arranged. Never before had I seen two paintings so hostile to one another, one bright sing, the other dark groans. If the two standing figures of Sarah and Lance and Hesch seemed cold and static and indifferent, the smaller painting is yet unfinished and never by itself titled Glows. I tear the large canvas of the off its stretcher frame and restretch fresh, naturally off-white, number 10 cotton duck canvas. Like any tabula rasa, it could go anywhere, become anything. I, I listen, I consider, I ruminate, and when I lie true, I yield to its power and comply. I'm cold, the large canvas complains. I want those hot colors from the electron microscope photographs of nerve cells you saw in the Scientific American. Of course, delighted with the concept, I mix containers of fluid, bright acrylic colors. The large canvas and I sashay into the shower where I soak its surface, then lay it face up on my studio floor and splash the colors all over it. The thirsty canvas slurps and savors the intermingling reds, greens, and blues. Art and literature know things that we can't. The book or painting, for example, knows not only the mood and circumstances of the create, creator, but also the things the creator's subconscious included that the creator didn't intend to include and may not even notice. <coughs> hey, where are my neurons? The now dry luminous canvas shouts. I mix more acrylic paints and quart-sized plastic yogurt containers a green with a luminescent mica powder, and also a blue. Then I fling them from one narrow side of the canvas toward its center, where they straddle a deep blue. Tipping the canvas this way and that, the two colors dance in rivulets toward one another, axons and dendrites reaching toward a, across a synapse to transfer knowledge, energy, ideas, passion. Eternity is a mysterious absence of times and ages, an endless length of ages always present and forever perfect, all ages being but successions. The infinite, Im immovable duration is eternity, the place and duration of all things. Even of infinite space itself, the cause and end and author and beautifier, the life and perfection of all. Ah, that's better, the canvas sighs. We paintings like to think. We like to talk, to shout. We want you to hear us. We want the world to recognize. We are alive. We breathe. Listen to us. Savor us. Feast your eyes and souls on us. Ingest us. Make us part of you. OK, OK, I thought. But you aren't enough by yourself. You holler, but you don't do anything. I told the large canvas. You don't go anywhere. 
I acknowledge that you're pretty, that you have a void at your core. Hey, Deb, the melodious voice of Sarah calls. What about us, all cold here, scrunched in this little canvas? Yeah, echoes Lance. That big canvas calls to me. Come here, let me embrace you. Oh, what a yummy idea, crooned Sarah. But how, kids, I ask. They don't reply, and I alone go to sleep thinking about it. Solution romping in my bed, having this way with me, advising. Just like you considered for Hesh, cut a hole in the big painting and insert the small painting into it. For several days, I wrestle with the idea, again placing the smaller painting on top of the larger one, repeatedly climbing up to my loft to decide its optimal position. I don't want it on top. It must be inserted, the face of both paintings flush to a single plane. Then I puzzle over the logistics, how to build a frame around the stretcher frame of the smaller painting, and build a brace within the frame of the larger painting to hold the smaller one in place. Okay, kids, you asked for it. Time to shut up and be quiet for a while. It's my show now. With all anticipated supplies nearby, I transform my studio into an operation theater. Adrenaline washes through me as I lay the large canvas face down on the floor and carefully cover, measure, and draw where to insert the smaller painting. Like a surgeon cutting into the unknown, I cut a hole three inches inside the drawn line. I fit a third set of four stretchers around the smaller painting and place them around the hole. Playing carpenter, I cut and fit stripes to hold the intermediary frame in position within the stretcher frames of the larger painting. I cut a diagonal slice from the corners of the smaller hole to the middle frame and seal the edges, draw up edges with acrylic medium and stretch and staple the flaps to the middle of the stretchers. Then imagining myself a gem setter, I place a smaller painting in the hole, everything still face down on the floor, and attach its stretchers to the intermediary stretchers. It takes me two days and an abundance of anxiety to build the surrounding frame and supports, during which the paintings are stuck in a long kiss with the floor. Insensitive to my heart and my throat, and pleading that they remain quiet, Sarah and Lance bitch the whole time. In its basso voice, the floor booms. It's all right, kids, including me and the monitor. Stay steady and continue. To the paintings, floor advises. Enjoy, enjoy our long kiss in the dark. I am. Who knew a floor had such visionary power, I muse, or was so sexy? By the time I complete a painting, we've sung and danced. We've walked to the end of the earth together. We've taken risks. We've endured screw-ups, we've made love, and have become one. With construction complete, the moment of reckoning arrives. Holding my breath, heart pounding, I lift the top of the conjoined canvases from the floor and inch it to rest against the wall. As I step back, Lance and Sarah whirl. We are, we are happy. We are, we are happy. And so they are. As I contemplate the painting, later titled Cinna, as a part of the Synapse series that it catalyzed, it continues to sing. In truth, it becomes a full chorus with orchestra. With swelling harmonies, it intones. Eternity magnifies our joys exceedingly. Eternity retains the moments of beginnings and endings within itself. Like the sun, we dart our rays before us and occupy those spaces with life and contemplation, which we move toward, but possess not within our body. Putting Sinna together represented a breakthrough that pointed toward realms I could not have anticipated. The remaining six of the seven small paintings of figures emerging from fields of color stained canvas stood on the floor of my studio. Every one of Sarah's and Lance's goosebumps <coughs> screamed to me of their loneliness, their inadequacy, their feelings of neglect. A larger context, please, they hollered in unison. The abstract nervescape of Sinna was a natural and colorful path to follow. 
Thus, the remaining months of 1985 through the early months of 1987 were consumed by working for the first time within the series. These seven led to 21 paintings in all. Finding and connecting with models is a constant challenge for a painter of the figure, especially one who is financially strapped. I would therefore turn to other organic objects to keep my eye, mind, hand coordination honed, such as botanical, botanicals and my own hands and feet. As I proceeded to create the larger context for the six small paintings, I included depictions of my hands in five of them. Just as with Cinna, a no hands context, I inserted the smaller paintings into their respective nerve scape, nerve handscape, so that the faces of the two paintings are flush. The synapse paintings are self-framed, which in the painted canvas wraps to the back. Painting has to rest upon one sentiment alone, or it has nothing. So says the early 20th century artist, Roiser Feilson. Nonsense, I say. The piece excised from the large synapse nervescape paintings so to accommodate the smaller large figure paintings inspired seven new paintings that I identify as reciprocal paintings. For these, I inverted each cutout and collaged it to a bigger painting, the imagery of which is in a large segment from the each figure drawing used in the respective synapse painting. Thus, reciprocity exists on several levels, such as inversion, scale, and the mirror titles. Cinna becomes, <coughs> becomes Ennis. Black satin finished metal frames enclose the seven reciprocal paintings. The mind is calm and full at the same time. The hand and eye are equally employed. In tracing the commonest object, a plant, the stump of a tree, you learn something every moment. You perceive unexpected differences and discover likenesses where you looked for no such thing. You try to set down what you see, find it out your error and correct it. You need not play tricks or purposely mistake. With all your pains, you are still far short of the mark. Patience grows out of the endless pursuit and turns it into a luxury. In the third and final set of seven, the hand paintings celebrate the hand drawings I created for the nervescape Albert Synapse painting, but omitted in Cinna and Essen. As I collaged smaller paintings of the hands to large color field paintings and added a neuron-inspired thick paint impasto image to float on the surface, walnut-stained oak stripping frames the seven hand paintings. Art is a subtle essence. It is not a thing that surfaces, but a moving spirit. All the paintings are in acrylic paints on number 10 cotton duck canvas. Textures range from the unprimed canvas into which liquid colors, figures, and hands are stained, to opaque iridescent paints obtained by adding metal and mica powders for the synapse imagery, and to impasto outlines of the collage canvas and an erotic image in the hand painting. The 21 paintings, seven trios, not only sing melodically and harmoniously of their happiness, like all paintings, they impart an important message. Receive us through your eyes. Enjoy us to your heart's content without trying to understand us or figure out what an artist is saying. If artists knew, they would tell rather than show. Enter us and celebrate whatever draws you in. Do we really deserve this rolled up and stuffed in a closet? Sarah's muffled cry, barely audible, seeped into my consciousness one day, six years after completing Cinna, the first of the 21 paintings. I'm all cramped and stiff, concurred Lance as if awakening from a deep sleep. Please let us out, unroll us, give us some air. Well, this was a surprise coming after such a long silence. What could I do but comply? 
I pulled out the original dismal canvas, unrolled it, and tacked it up on the studio wall. Plopping back on my day bed to study it, I could see why Lance and Sarah were unhappy. It made me despondent just to look at its scraps. No doubt it expressed the misery that I felt back in 1983 but refused to recognize, let alone admit at the time, sadness that my affair with Lance would remain episodic at best. Now I was again angry as well as despondent. In 1989, I was summarily dismissed from a four-year live-together relationship that had begun soon after completing Sina. Thinking that this relationship was for something approaching forever, I'd given my beds, kitchen utensils, and appliances to my kids who were both in their early 20s and setting up domiciles on their own. In the intervening years, I had painted two other Nerdscape series of large two-canvas paintings, dendrite with a female model, and an axon from drawings of plants whom I continued to see when he came to Philadelphia, but not as a lover. When the Live Together relationship ended in 1989, I had my studio, but I had to find a place to live, furnish my kitchen at home, and search for paying jobs. As well, I had just signed a contract with artist Merle Spandorfer to be the writing author of Making Art Safely which left me little time for artwork. My studio was a consolation in rock <coughs> from which I saw <coughs> Clara, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> clarity about going forth with my life, a central part of which was to continue painting in whatever way I could, even if it meant, if it meant small canvases. I reused stretcher strips from older paintings and stretched them with leftover canvas scraps. When I began these new paintings, it was with a deliberate intention to transform and transcend my anger, hurt, and lost equanimity into something healing and meaningful. The result was works composed of three canvases, each one of the natural materials I'd painted on for a number of years, linen, cotton, and silk. I fastened them top to bottom. The top is rectangular linen canvas with dimensional linen collage and represents my rage. The middle is trapezial, four sides of unequal length, cotton dot canvas with a figure fragment to represent me, all those others model. <coughs> the bottom is trapezial, natural silk congee on which my tears puddle. The tile floors are mostly appropriated for master painting. Threnody one through six, created in 1989, are monochromatic with graphite and interference colors, which are iridescent, having apparent appearance depending upon light reflection. Two years later, in response to Lance and Sarah's griping, I created new Threnody paintings. Having exhausted the six primary and secondary colors, I gave them, largely in response to the colors of Hesh, bichromatic complementary colors, red and green, and orange and blue. But then I realized I needed a third figure for yellow and violet. So I created a new painting from for the middle canvas of Threnody 9, using another drawing I'd done of Lance, he and I had resumed our occasional love relationship. Neither Sarah nor Lance has spoken again from their various canvases, at least within my earshot. Perhaps it's because I took a break from the figure and turned to botanicals and then to architecture for inspiration. Or it could be because, yet again, I cut off their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Description of the Romania of Varro painting, 
and, and what he was doing was that was an ex ex crisis uh, process, and that's, that's part of what I'm choosing to do and explore. So I'm interested in your thoughts, comments, questions. Lisa? First of all, prestigious art school that, and I thought I was going I was going to be the theory of design and so I went to the graphic design department and then I think <coughs> that was glorified commercial art about which I wanted nothing I was too still in the head in the clouds at the time so after one semester I transferred but in that in that graphic design department it was in a building that had these these um, poured concrete ceilings with with regular triangles that trapped vapors and there was no good ventilation whatsoever and I would walk into the printmaking studio, my eyes would stream, my nose would run, my throat would get raw and and so and I said I just have to get out of here. So after one semester I transferred to draw and going back a year and and uh, the building we were in at that time was none of the windows fit. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was lots of ventilation and we all wore warm clothes and, and <coughs> cut fingers off of gloves because they didn't have fingerless gloves back then, mm -hmm. but um, just to, to keep, keep working and, and so the ventilation was adequate. But I switched from, from oils to acrylics as soon as it was possible and that was halfway through the next year and stayed with them. I gave away all of my oil paints to a, a camp that was short of supplies in 1972. Mm -hmm. So that was very big, very big in my, not in my decision writing, but <coughs> the arm twisted by Merle Sandorfer, who almost died because of her reaction to, mm -hmm. to uh, toxic materials that she never realized. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try water-based oils? No, I haven't. No, I mean, there, there, there's evidence that, that the, the water base, the water soluble, whatever, and, and the, or the um, water soluble oil. Right. Uh, have far less volatile organic compounds, vapors, and what have you, so that they are safer. And, and the same thing with the yield rise, the reduced vapor of, of various turpentines and minerals the earth and so forth. There's been a tremendous progress. touch-up things for three years. Yeah. I think that's, that, I mean, some of you, some of you did know John, he just loved the IDLA and would come to conferences and, and be an active part of it. And, and I just really felt after he died that I, I needed to reinvent my life somehow and take a very active role in that process. So, and, and, and I also, I, what I did, I met with a lot of other widows and kept their brains about how they moved on and it kept coming up that I, I wanted, I had this hunger to write more creatively. Yes, Mark. I was um, directed to the, the way to develop your day quotations that you uh,
Well, oh, great. I hope you all heard that question. Malka was asking why, what was the difference between my, whether, how I treated the quotations in my paintings and, and how I saw them, whether, or whether they interlaced. Is that an adequate restatement? You have with my paintings the dialogue that I have with the quotations. And the quotations, I feel, in some way express the depth of my process. Painting has always been to me a, a deeply meditative process. And so uh, I, I interjected them this way, I think, as a, as a metaphor for the process. That, that when I put them in, it was to interject a sense of time. And I would be very interested to know from you how well that worked in that sense as well. But, uh, they, and, and I have been criticized for interjecting uh, quotations in the text. I use them a lot at the beginning of a chapter. I'm writing my, my article biography. That's one of the things I'm working on. And I've just finished 1979, so I have quite a ways to go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, the sense was that in these that it, it was more accessible as an, as an interview. Named Deborah Pratt Curtis at my birth in New York City in 1937, as a child I showed little artistic talent or interest in art. As a teenager, however, I discovered at museums that I could enter paintings and escape from my problems. Ever since, my quest has been to understand the allure and power of paintings. Rather than take an art historical path, 
I chose to explore the mystery of painting through the study of aesthetics and by making paintings myself. After three years at Antioch College, I gained admission to Yale University School of Art. Influenced by abstract expressionism of the time, my early paintings were inspired by my love of the ocean. At my first drawing class, I fell in love with the human figure. For more than 40 years thereafter, I drew and painted the figure as nature's most complex and challenging form. I did not paint in a conventional way, however, nor did I try to depict a specific person or even a nude as such. At first, I covered the details of my drawing with flat color and explored simple figure ground issues by juxtaposing the figures with collaged patterned fabrics and papers. As my confidence grew, I introduced contour lines first painted, and then by leaving unprimed bare canvas exposed for the outlines and negative spaces. Inspired by my own experiences in life, I endeavored to express inner and other realities, realities that are sensed, felt, but otherwise unable to be articulated. Thus, metaphor became my guide as I depicted simplified landscapes and abstract forms within and outside the figures. There came a time when I could no longer ignore the magic of light and shadow, how they can both reveal and conceal form. One group of paintings required a larger context, and it was into abstract nerve scapes that I inserted the smaller canvases. While engaged with metaphoric reality, I also came to reject the so-called window view of the world that had dominated art since the Renaissance. Since 1987, I have constructed trapezial-shaped canvases with four sides of unequal length. I think of them as shards that reflect the fragmentation of contemporary life. Despite my efforts to present metaphors for our humanists, Viewers seem to see the human figure solely as a nude is a nude. Discouraged from altering the bias of a sex-obsessed audience, I accepted invitations to group exhibits that addressed specific topics. Themes included architecture, portraits in conjunction with a designed object, the city of Prague, obscure cities, and water. Having long recognized the act of painting as a form of meditation, responding to a theme deepened my reverie. I'd meditate on what to paint, how to paint it, and the validity of each choice I made pertaining to format, materials, color, and the techniques to employ along the journey of bringing a painting to completion. With ongoing concerns about what we are doing to our planet, I embarked upon meditations on a post-human earth. Rather than drawing nature and creating my paintings from the drawings, as in the past, the imagery is from juxtaposed collages that I create. Lacking specific orientation, these objects for meditation may be hung in any direction, at any angle, as decided by the individual who hangs them. Ideally, they will be hung in ways that will optimize their impact within a given context. A consistent thread throughout my life's work has been to integrate philosophical concepts with painting. A group of physicists recently postulated that the human race is essential for, and to, the universe. This may be my next theme. Through continued learning and thinking, I discover inspiration for my art, and ways to say what can be said no other way.
writing is poetry, nonfiction, and fiction combination. I actually have a question. After yes. That. Mm -hmm. So um, when we we derive meaning from our own perceptions when viewing art, mm -hmm. so when the artworks we're talking to, I feel that Ezra that was your own subconscious speaking, and so in that regard, um, cutting off your head. I'm not sure I want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think the, the idea that, as I say, that prompt that I started out with, that was a thing I just took off like a bat out of hell mm -hmm. with that as a concept. And I've since looked at, at some of my other paintings and I think, oh my gosh, there are narratives in there they don't have to do with me. Mm -hmm. That's, and, and I'm thinking of it more as a narrative, a storytelling kind of thing. I don't know if you remember the the, it was toward the end, but it was it was a view of, of um, the Duomo in Florence with, with three statues, an angel, and two figures. And, <coughs> and uh, that's on my studio wall right now. And I can sort of imagine the the uh, angel saying, quit, quit your cramming. What the hell are you arguing about? And they said, well, there's this old lady sitting down there on the steps of the Campanile. And who does, she, who does she think she is trying to draw us from down there? You know, things like that. <laughs> There's anywhere I can go with that. And it's, it's just, it's the fun of it, it's the joy of it. And I think if anything you leave this session with is there's creative life after academia. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so Deborah, when you view art like upstairs in our gallery, when you go view art, does that, does, what period or what genre speaks to you most do you have, or is it just random? I, I, I basically take, and this is something that I, uh, my best friend in high school was mother, who was an art aesthetics kind of person, and I ran into her on the street in New York City because I was going to all the alleys all the time. And uh, she, she said, so many of us feel obliged to look at everything. And she said, you know, you walk into a gallery, and you just sort of scan it, and what calls to you, follow what calls to you, and then go and enter it, and be there with it, and, and yeah, and I, that has worked <coughs> volumes for me. So I'm all centuries, all countries, all places, and so forth and so on. I spent five or six hours yesterday at the, the Detroit Institute of the Arts, and, and uh, my eyeballs still feel like they're <laughs> just now getting back into my skull, but, and so that I can spend more time here. Right. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Uh, thank you all for your mm -hmm. ideas, your attention, 